I don't want to be the last speaker between a crowd and a beer, and I'm, if I do, then I'm relying on you to buy me one, so I need you to all uh, pull in for that one there, please. And look, I'd just like to say welcome to our shareholders here. We've got quite a, an amazing, wonderful team of shareholders in, in town and, 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 and further afield, and a lot of them have driven up a long way to be here tonight, so thanks very much. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, and uh, really appreciate the support, actually. Um, firstly, uh, Maud, uh, I should apologise for the photograph on the bottom right-hand side. It's all blurred, and I asked Jacques, why is that so? And he says, there is so much copper in this drill core, it reflects the light, so I'm running with that. Uh, we'll just take this as red. This, this is a standard issue there. Um, Mod was a small moribund company um, with some licenses in, in Botswana there uh, going back sort of four or five years and um, down to the skill and expertise of Jacques uh, in March this year um, made a major discovery which we call T3. T stands for target, this is target number three and uh, that's obviously the spike on the left hand side <clears throat> and then within six months the second spike is the resource. Uh, We've drilled out a substantial resource and um, uh, by the end of November, as our shareholders know, we've promised to uh, announce the results of our scoping study for a, for a nine to ten year mine life, um, which is uh, all in the space of nine months exactly from discovery. So uh, we're not hanging about, we're just getting on with the job here. Um, the, the market cap <clears throat> background on the company there. There's a lot of paper, there's a lot of legacy in there that goes back way before myself and, and Jacques here. Uh, market cap sitting around about 40 million. Um, we've been very uh, active discussions uh, in London in the last couple of days. Uh, and obviously uh, there's some interest in copper and, and clearly some interest in what we're doing here in Botswana. And uh, we're going to be at Mines and Money centre stage, I hope, and uh, flying the flag for this wonderful country. and. Uh, huge potential that really does exist in Botswana. Um, management team, very solid guys, they're all seasoned veterans, everyone's been around the block um, in all sorts of facets of exploration and mine development and processing and, uh, and selling concentrates globally and all sorts of stuff here. So, uh, and I should point out too, very importantly for us here in this kind of part of the world as well, that our um, T3 discovery forms just part of a very substantial joint venture holding that we have with Metal Tiger. Uh, initially that was a deal negotiated with, with Paul and um, it's very important for us. Uh, Mod's position is 70%. Uh, Metal Tiger wrote the first check um, back in I think September last year when we were really stretched for funding. And a bit like um, Andrew earlier on tonight, I mean we bought this right at the bottom of the cycle in copper and uh, we bought it off uh, Liquidator provisional liquidator and uh, man there are some good deals to be had in those when those two collide so uh, we got very lucky on this project. Um, copper outlook <clears throat> four years of sort of downward from around about four dollars a pound um, and really uh, there are definitely signs of recovery and, and the little graph on the left hand side this is post Donald you know last month um, it's gone up 20 percent you know no one picked that <laughs> and uh, and then really the, the blue line is, uh, is the uh, consensus copper pricing of only a month ago. And uh, where we're pitching our first production is uh, around about mid-2019. And um, that was uh, slide is one month old. And the market uh, price now for copper is actually above the consensus pricing uh, two years into the future. And then the red line just shows UBS's call on copper. And I... A few cynics about some, some of UBS uh, research, but this is very thorough, very, pretty robust kind of analysis of, of copper and mines and stockpiles and demand, all these sort of things there. So uh, that puts it at $3. That's th uh, courtesy of uh, UBS research. I should already put that uh, in there. Um, just quick intro, and there's geologists in the room, so, uh, and I'm one and Jacques another. Um, but there's really basically three deposit types in, in copper. You're, you're either a big, large, brutish, ugly mining company that takes on the porphyries, in, particularly in Chile and Peru, and you know they dominate the, the planet in terms of production, but the grade tends to be low. They tend to be fairly mature mines now. This has been a long-term 
um, mining venture. They're exposed very much to energy costs, diesel, power. Um, uh, and the deeper porphyry mines go, they tend to get more arsenic rich. They tend to grade decline. So globally, porphyry grades around about the 0.4, maybe 0.5 um, percent copper. Huge capital required and, and as I say, um, long-term uh, future is uh, maybe not what it was. Uh, on the top right, these are the sort of the flashy, the, these are VMS, the volcanic massive, hosted massive sulphide deposits and, and these Canada, Australia, um, all over the place really, but they tend to be really beautiful high-grade massive sulphide deposits. Um, again, problem looming here I think and that there's been decades of exploration in the right areas for these sort of deposits and again maturity is setting in um, and Despite their class, uh, they're multi-commodity. They'll often have silver, gold, zinc, all these sort of things. But they tend not to be that huge. So the one on the top right, Kid Creek VMS deposit, I think it's the deepest base metal mine in the world, around about three kilometres. Um, if I've got the numbers right, and, and this is, needs verification, but overall it's only produced about 2.5 million tonnes of copper. I mean, not only, but it, that's what it's produced. The, the bottom section is really to show the, the, the ultimate prize in copper, I think, here is the sediment hosted deposits. And uh, globally, uh, Zambia DRC dominate this field. Um, Kupfer Schiefer is a variation on that throughout sort of Eastern and Central Europe for hundreds of years. But this um, style of deposit that we see here, these are stratigraphic, uh, they tend to be very continuous, or at least the, the host sequence of them tends to be very, very continuous. And the slide here is, is um, Ivanhoe Mines, uh, Kamoa deposit in DRC. And this is 750-odd uh, million tonnes of 2.5 copper. Uh, there's around about 20 million tonnes of copper here currently in resource, I think at an indicated level here. Um, it's a, just to give an idea of scale, it's 50 square kilometres in area. I mean, this is a big sheet-like deposit. Uh, it, its um, true width is around about 5 metres, and it dips very shallow as best we know it. So we need to understand this deposit a little bit more because the geology setting here and the zonation of the copper sulphides that we see here uh, certainly bears some resemblance to what we're seeing in, in Botswana, which has um, long been um, aligned with this type of deposit. We're in this region of sedimentary hosted <coughs> copper deposits. Um, the project summary, um, MOD <coughs> is a ma and, and Metal Tiger, we have a major holding in a, in a copper belt around about 11,500 kilometres. We were very fortunate to get that and we worked extremely hard last year to uh, make that all happen and we've worked very closely with the Botswana government uh, in terms of satisfying some of their uh, objectives I think in, in Botswana. Um, it is actually the largest holding, it's probably um, two thirds of the copper belt that we consider prospective. And unique, I think, the situation here. Um, there are many deposits uh, that it's been very poorly explored historically where we are. And I think the potential really has been un, un misunderstood, hasn't been realised. Um, MOD, it started out the year, the uh, Minister for Mines, they signed off on our <coughs> licence acquisition of about 8,000 square kilometres uh, in February. Um, we sat down with Metal Tigers Chairman Terry Grammer, and Terry and I go back a long time, 15 years, we founded a nickel company which uh, took off in Western Australia, and, and, uh, we, uh, uh, and, and Jacques, and we defined 10 targets, T1 to T, T10, and uh, Jacques running the exploration there, we got as far as the first four, four targets, we hit copper in all of them, Jacques hit the copper in all of them, but T3, that was the last one that we got to, and that was in March, and we haven't moved since. It is just, we're, we're anchored to the, to the ground there. T3 is, is uh, really the standout. Um, and the discovery cost uh, and resource cost to get the discovery drilling and then drill 55 or whatever it is, diamond holes to define the first resource here, is only been US 1.7 million. Uh, it's 0.22 cents per pound. I'm sure if we were, had the time to make comparisons with other discoveries, it's, it's, it's right out there at the top of the list. Um, the scoping study for an open pit in a plant, we've, that's due to be completed in three days' time. It is completed, it's due to be announced, sorry. Uh, but thank you to ASX two weeks ago 
they announced um, a new set of guidelines for announcing scoping studies. They've sorry, produced a new, new, new set of guidelines which run to many pages. So we've got three people and hopefully, regardless of the time of night, they're still working tonight to get this all the boxes ticked and how we can actually get that news out um, to our shareholders uh, to, to hit our deadline of the end of the month. And of course, we're, we'll be at Mines and Money, hopefully with that done and dusted. But what, what we have announced, we're dealing with a, a, a mine life for our um, first uh, um, foray into T3 here of nine years, um, and at a, at a production rate of two million tonnes per annum. And the, the gaps there, we hope to have filled in by uh, within, within days. So that's what we've announced to uh, get to that position by the end of November. Um, we know that the deposits in Botswana are kind of a bit of an exceptional situation in that they produce very high grade, very high quality concentrates. Uh, and there's copper and silver, the silver reports to the copper concentrate. Um, the gr average grade in Botswana for copper concentrate around about 40%, so compares globally with probably tw around about 25%. So that has big impact on, um, and the purity and the low arsenic content has a big impact on um, payment from smelters and, and it's a wonderful blend stock for smelters that have marginal kind of quality products so we're, we're trying to pitch for that niche if you like um, and it also impacts on the transport cost because you've got to ship transport or road rail whatever but if you've got twice as much copper in the concentrate it you, you basically transport cost halves so uh, and the significant exploration upside which Jacques is going to talk about uh, the structure here uh, is a little bit complicated, but if you just look at the right-hand side, it's MOD and Metal Tiger, 7030. We have a, a, a London shell, which we call Metal Capital, um, which Cameron came up with that name uh, originally. And so that is just sitting out there, but basically that's the funnel which the joint venture uses to fund money into <coughs> our uh, Botswana <coughs> entity, which is called Shikudu Metals, and Shikudu is Rhino in uh, Setswana. Um, there's a company below that that currently holds the licenses, which is called Discovery Mines, which, which we, will we are now working again with the Botswana Department of Mines to shift those licenses back into Shikudu. So we have a clear operating uh, entity in, in Botswana, and uh, that again sort of satisfies employment and tax and all sorts of uh, going forward things to consider. MOD's got its own interests on the left hand side as well. Um, we own some very interesting uh, projects in our own right in the same area and adjacent to uh, the Shikuda licenses. Um, showing here the copper belt extending about 400 kilometres <coughs> from the northeast. Uh, if anyone's been to the Okavango you would have landed almost certainly I guess at Maun which is tourist central in this part of the world. Um, and we and, and we sit basically um, down the southwestern end. All the shades of red and orange, are basically uh, uh, controlled by either the Mod Metal Tiger Joint Venture or Mod 100%. Uh, and it's, it's we're dealing with hundreds of kilometres here. So there's a scale bar there to just give some idea of the, the scale. Uh, we base all of our operations out of Hunzi, which is a town on the left-hand side, and that's part of our social. Um, uh, uh, event, I guess, and, and, and uh, strategy here in, in Botswana. So if we get T3 up and running as a pit, um, we'll base everyone out of that town and we'll drive in and out. We're not looking to build villages. We're, we're, we're happy to use the excellent facilities that exist there already. And we would probably become one of the biggest employers in town straight away. Um, uh, sort of to the northeast of us, uh, there are um, uh, licenses. I'm sorry, there's just a pale blue outline there, but that's a company called Cooper and Canyon Capital, which has been bankrolled by Barclays uh, Bank, and now their global natural resource, sorry, global resource fund. Um, but they've acquired over a series of steps there a significant holding and a significant resource base. There's around about five million tons of copper and resources in the area immediately to the northeast of us. Um, and that's in seven deposits, of which currently uh, the largest is, is a thing called Zone 5. It's 100 million tonnes of 2% copper. It's going to be an underground mine and a substantial copper producer. If you look at the difference between the blue area on the right and the red area on the left, 
the blue area on the right has had a lot of history of drilling and exploration. Uh, the area to the left has had, I can't say none, because there's been some really mediocre historic efforts there, but is virtually untouched. Now, all the way to the Namibian border, and then the exploration and the drilling in the copper picks up as you go west beyond that north-south line there, so in the left-hand side of the picture. Um, through the middle of the belt, one of the great assets here is it's a, it's a wonderful highway. It's, it's, a, it's a bit like Malawi, I think. There's just a two-lane two highway, and, and the Botswana Power Corporation is committed to building, uh, sorry, extending the, tr the transmission lines from the coal fields down this highway in the next two to three years. So that'll run right through the centre of the copper belt, right past our um, project at T3, and uh, and uh, hopefully we can feed off that and reduce power costs. And we're taking all that into account in our scoping study, but uh, that'll come out shortly. The T, the circles there are our exploration targets. Um, T3, I've got a pointer here somewhere, but the um, T3 is, 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 is in this little area here, and that sits within a, a hundred kilometer uh, corridor, which um, we regard as highly prospective. Uh, there's no outcrop. It's all covered by farmland. This is actually cattle country. There's drought master um, and Brahmin cross cattle bred mostly in Queensland, actually, in, in Australia. Um, but that is, a, for us, our absolute premium uh, target area, and uh, there's many things to be done there. Uh, Botswana, um, the, the, it sort of sits in a bit of a niche grade range here. Um, you get the low-grade porphyries globally, then there's a kind of a jump up to the, the volcanic hosted deposits and the, uh, also the uh, DRC Zambian copper belt sediment host deposits. So most of the deposits that we know about at this stage sit in that 1.2 to 2% range with good silver credits. Um, and as I say, very, produce very high quality concentrates. Uh, there's a very good, um, well long established mining industry. It's the major industry in Botswana is diamonds, as, as you probably know. Uh, and the uh, education standards in the, uh, are exceptionally high <coughs> throughout the country and English speaking wherever you go. Hunzi Highway photograph of it, and we keep telling Botswana Co Corporation, we want to see the transmission lines in that photograph, please, on the left hand side, heading towards our mine as you go west. Um, resource currently where we are is that in September, six months from the discovery hole, we announced our first resource, um, 28 million tonnes at 1.2 copper and 15 gram silver, half an ounce silver. Uh, we have effectively, 64% of that was in, in the indicator category because of continuity. It's very holding together really well, this deposit here, and really of the the, the, what we're looking at in the pit, no, I'm sorry, I've just got to draw the line there. We haven't actually announced this bit, so anyway. So we're looking at a, that resource forms the basis of our, of our scoping study. I've got to remember what I'm saying here. <laughs> uh, within that resource, there's high grade at 8.5 million tonnes at 2.2 effectively and 30 gram silver. And really what we see is, is a deposit with disseminated sulphide mineralisation throughout and then bonanza grade uh, silver copper veins which, because of the drill spacing, we're still not quite uh, defined them as best as we should, because there's a really interesting scenario we're looking at as to whether, if we were to mine this deposit and, and go ahead with it, whether we mine and bulk the whole thing up or whether we selectively mine these bonanza veins, which are loaded with metal. So um, all that's sort of for the next level of evaluation which is obviously a PFS. So th this is just a, um, a, a drill plan which we put out at from the first drill hole as, as Jacques and his team. We had four diamond rigs here operating over a six month period. Uh, intersection widths up to uh, I think the deep, uh, thickest intersection in diamond about 45 metres. We're dealing with true widths so it's, it virtually sub outcrops on the southern dotted line here and dips very gently to the northwest at about 30 degrees. Um, we believe it's um, still open along strike, particularly, uh, and um, we've, we're doing some drilling now to test that, but uh, that's all in the future. So it was drilled out on a 100 by 100 metre pat in the resource, and I think that's quite important. I mean, many deposits are closed into 40 metres, 20 metres, whatever, but the continuity here is, again, uh, very good. So that's, uh, and the mining, um, when you're considering mining, that's one of the most important factors. The discovery hole was um, an intersection there of 
uh, it's in white, you never read it from there, I'm sure, but 50, t the, literally there was a 28 ppm copper soil anomaly that we announced, we're going to put a hole under it. Shark went out there with the drill rig and if, I think it was the third hole basically, we got it right, the direction here, 52 metres at 2% copper. So that was the big kick in the, in the stock price there. Um, pit, we're considering these different pit options here uh, for mining, uh, staged pits. Uh, down to 200 metres basically, uh, but big wide gutsy ore zones. The block model um, shows clearly these high grade core to the deposit. These other parallel zones that we um, I think uh, <coughs> consider may well be ov over thrust. These are structural uh, remobilisation of copper in t in within the sedimentary package uh, that we have here and the sort of thickening results from, from that structural kind of stacking of the, the, the sequence here. Um, and just to give you an idea of width, that's around about 50 metres wide, um, and that, that basically forms, you know, that's what bulking all of that derives that 28 million tonne resource as we go now. Uh, metallurgically, we've got very lucky on this, um, uh, in that the dominant uh, sulphide minerals are a bornite chalcosite with chal and chalcopyrite, um, but they're all high tenor copper sulphides, and and they carry uh, the silver with them. And you can see the sort of flotation test work of the chalcopyrite ore particularly. Uh, but we're seeing very, very high uh, recoveries and concentrate grades. So in, in any sort of copper recovery, you, you're looking at the sort of 93, 95%. So we're getting 96, 90, 98, 90, 98 point more actually. But this is just the preliminary test work. So this will be refined further. And that producing these very high grade con uh, concentrates uh, from the test work and, and also high silver recoveries. Uh, the other thing too that um, this nickel company I was involved with, we pioneered in Australia this concentrate transport in sealed containers and once you've got under that you just don't turn the clock back to bulk con concentrate transport. This is just a whole nother level of efficiency and has many, many benefits. So, you know, we're already in discussion and taking these sort of things into consideration, but with the, with the government, uh, and it should hopefully shorten our permitting environmental timeframes. It's sealed, you can't go wrong with this stuff. Um, and this is a two million tonne sulphide flotation plant. Um, obviously, a, a, just a graphic there, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, but we're going for simplicity on all levels in the scoping study. Simple open pit mines, simple metallurgy, uh, simple processing here to get a, a high quality product. So I think um, what I'll do, I'll just hand over to Jack to wind up with, or not wind up, just tell us a bit about the rocks. Part of the exploration was the IP program <coughs> and a very simple IP program that we, uh, that we put on the ground simply to test the regional, the regional prospectivity with a five kilometer IP line. That was done way back in uh, 2008 for Hannah, and it worked well. The important thing is the continuity of the mineralized horizon stretching down dip. And we are in the process of testing the IP anomaly and see what the essence of that is. So we've got the idea that uh, IP is actually reflecting the local stratigraphy. Deeper IP drilling is planned, or a deeper hole is planned. But before we do that, we are aiming to do a regional three kilometer long by a kilometer wide three dimensional IP um, survey, which is due to kick off in the beginning of December before this year comes to an end. You need to crack the code now for the simple reason it's not been found where it is. T3 is lying where there should be nothing. And I was listening to some of the blokes out here earlier tonight about say copper there, say copper there. Uh, it's easier said than done. To make a discovery and be as, as successful as we were in the first nine months doesn't happen every day not to every geologist. So it's not something that happens on a consistent basis. So just look, conclusion there, I guess, uh, it's a really one-off uh, opportunity, this one here. 
T3 is a really significant, it's different, it's out of the box. And uh, so out, we're out there as, uh, now that T3's kind of got its own life, uh, we're out there looking for the next one. And, and you know, there's this type deposit and a, the knowledge has grown so rapidly in six months now that, uh, you know, we're feeling pretty uh, punchy about the whole thing. I should say too that actually the, all the board and management team, because it was a subject discussed a bit earlier, uh, uh, are extremely motivated on this project and also have substantial shareholdings in this company. So <laughs> that also helps, even uh, in, uh, in country as well. So um, we look, we're targeting first production. And you know, if we get lucky on timing, then uh, if we follow some of the other research on copper, then you know, we're gonna um, pitch it into the right sort of market. Um, and the low cost of discovery and, and this flat dip, and perhaps this opportunity that as Jacques said, this sort of sinformal dome kind of uh, control on the um, geometry of this uh, host sequence there, yet to be proven and yet to be tested by drilling, but uh, we're, we're closing in on it pretty quickly now. Um, and uh, really, I mean, Botswana is pretty hard to beat. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just highly rated five star but in, you know, for, for those of us on the ground, it's a wonderful country to operate in, it really is. And uh, we enjoy working with um, all sorts of government agencies and people uh, that we're involved with in a local and kind of, and, uh, and the farming community and all these sort of things. So it, it doesn't really come any better than uh, Botswana to explore and, and hopefully mine. And so I'll just wrap it up there. Thanks very much.